Hello guys, welcome to this new video. So this is going to be question 3 in the May 2023 time zone 1 paper 2. So here we are told that a transverse wave is traveling to the right. And the diagram shows the surface of the water at time t, at t equals 0. P and Q show two quarks, two quarks floating on the surface. So first of all, let's think about what kind of graph we were given. We see that the x units are displacement and also the y units are the displacement. And we're also told that this is at t equals zero. So when we're given a graph like this of a transverse wave, the way we can think about it is this is like a snapshot of the wave. Snapshot. So imagine the water waves um, going up and down and at one moment we just go to the side, take a picture and they put that picture in front of us here. So that is what we see right here, it's just, that, it's just that instead of the water and stuff, we see some axes and we see a sine graph. But other than that, it's the exact same. And then in the first question, we need to state what is meant by a transverse wave. So this is simply a, a definition that we need to remember. And so a transverse wave is just when uh, the displacement of the particles or the displacement, yeah, displacement of particles is perpendicular perpendicular to direction of energy transfer. Or we can also say wave propagation so what that just means is that the particles in the water wave move up and down, whereas the wave travels to the right. And if we look at the angle between these two arrows, this will be 90 degrees. And this is when we have a uh, transverse wave. A longitudinal wave is the other type of wave we could be asked here, which is just when the particles, instead of moving up and down, they move left and right and the wave still will travel to the right, then we see that here the angle is, well, 180 degrees or 0 degrees, and so that's when they're both in the same direction. So that would be a longitudinal wave. And then we are told the frequency of this wave. We need to calculate the speed. So we this is also one more question, so we just need to apply a simple formula which is that the speed of a wave is just its frequency times its wavelength. And well, since we're given this type of graph where this is like a snapshot, we can very easily identify the wavelength as the wavelength is just the, the, the length of the wave between two um, points in phase. So for example, we can look at the difference in distance between this point and this point, but we could have also chosen this point and this point or this point and this point, or any points in between, as long as they are one period apart. So like two pi apart. And then we see that this is 16 meters, as 15 is over here, and then one more unit to the right. So we know that the wavelength is 16, we know the frequency, so we just plug this in. So this is 16 times 0 0.5, which is 8 meters per second. So that is the speed of the wave. And then we need to plot on the diagram the position of P at time t equals 0 0.5 seconds. Well, so we know that this was at t equals 0, and we know that it's moving to the right. So let me just erase this. So, and then we want the wave at 0 0.5 seconds, and we move to the right, meaning if we would draw the graph again, it would, it would have moved to the right. So if I try and draw it again, it will look something like this. And then we'll have another minimum somewhere over here. So we have shifted over by some units at um, after 0 0.5 seconds as we move to the right and well well one might think that the 
P particle moves over here as as maybe some people would seem that logical would think that's logical but uh, it's actually not quite correct because because as we said as in the definition the particles move perpendicular to the direction of the energy transfer so the waves the points on the wave don't follow the wave so they don't move along with the wave so this so the p point moving over here would be incorrect as it doesn't move with the wave rather it only moves up and down so we see that here at zero seconds it was over here and it must have moved moved up here after 0 0.5 seconds as that is where the wave is after 0 0.5 seconds it all the p point every point has to be along their own vertical line they cannot go off this vertical line they only move up and down so for example q would be over here as again this can also only move on this vertical line and this is true for every other point on this graph it cannot the particles don't move left and right they only move up and down and so we just have to see where the new wave will be and so p has, must have traveled up there yes and then we need to show that the phase difference between the oscillations of the two quarks is pi radians well this can be done quite easily as well as we can just see that the wave the the difference i mean like the distance between p and q is eight meters or you can also just see it's half a wavelength and since we have half a wavelength difference so they are eight meters apart which is half a wavelength and we know one wavelength is 2 pi as these this wave is 2 pi periodic it repeats itself every 2 pi and if we have a difference of of half lambda then we must know then it must be that half lambda is pi so if they're half lambda apart they're half a wavelength apart from this it follows that there's a phase difference of pi radians and that is how we can show their phase difference now we uh, go on to some slits so we are told that monochromatic light is incident on two very narrow slits the light that passes through the slits is observed on the screen m is directly opposite to the midpoints of the slits x represents the displacement from m in the direction shown a student argues that what will be observed on the screen will be a total of two bright spots and we need to say why this hypothesis is incorrect well first of all we need to see that we have diffraction here as we have light traveling through slits so they will undergo diffraction and they will interfere with each other so they interfere constructively or destructively depending on their path difference and so if they interfere there must be a diffraction pattern on the screen pattern on the screen like this and and uh, so since we have and we know that this diffraction pattern consists of multiple um, bright and dark spots so this has multiple bright spots and um, yeah so we will have a double slit diffraction pattern which we know has more than two bright spots we could also argue that since well we, we know what this will look like about we know that there cannot be two two spots it has to be an odd number of slits bright slits as we know that in the middle we will have one and we know that this is symmetrical always so if we have one up here we must have one down here and in this way we will always have an odd number as if we have one on the top we must have one on the bottom as well so we can never get an even number of a even number of bright spots and yeah i don't i don't really know how this why the student would think that there will only be two bright spots maybe they think that the light will just go through the slits like this and then there will be two bright spots that's all i can imagine actually i don't know why else uh, this would be 
maybe then we would have to also say that uh, light undergoes diffraction and that's why we have this so light undergoes diffraction and so it's not just going to sh straight pass uh, sh like pass through and maybe that's what IB is trying to get at here that the student thought that the light would just go straight through the slits with no with no effect on each other no in no no diffraction here but as we know that there is diffraction so that's not really possible and then we are given the actual variation with displacement of the intensity on the screen i naught is the intensity of the light at the screen from one slit only okay so explain why the intensity of the light at x equals zero is four i zero so when we have one slit only we know that the amplitude of our wave amplitude of wave is just well let's just say it's a we have some amplitude a we have some 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 function saying uh, showing our uh, light source and has an amplitude a now we know that x equals zero we have constructive interference so at x equals zero we have constructive interference as we have a maximum intensity point there and so we know that there when they interfere there the two waves amplitudes from the two slits will have to add up so resulting wave will have to have a amplitude double that of the two two individual waves so we'll have two a two times the amplitude of of just one of the waves and well we kind of have to know and see in the data booklet what relationship we have between intensity and amplitude and in fact we will see that that uh, intensity varies with the amplitude squared there's also another relationship which we don't need here but is that the intensity varies with one over the distance squared so these are the two relationships we need for intensity and well if we know that intensity varies with displacement squared we know so here we doubled the amplitude double a and therefore we're going to let's see what ratio the intensity is going to change by so if we doubled a and we don't need to square this to see how intensity changes we will see that this is 4a squared so if a produced an intensity of just i0 then 4a will produce an intensity of 4i0 logically and so that's why we're going from an intensity of i0 to four times i0 due to this constructive interference phenomenon and then we are told that the slits are separated by a distance of 0 0.18 meters distance between distance to the screen is 2.2 determine in meters the wavelength of the light so this is just a typical double slit question where we're going to need to use this formula where we're, where we're given we, need, we can calculate the distance between fringes as a function of the wavelength the d, big d is the distance from the screen and small d is the distance of the slits so we have we're going to have to use this graph over here we see that uh, this whole graph has a length of four centimeters and we need to see what is the separation of 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 one fringe it's kind of problematic to read this off the graph here as it's like some some random value in between so if we would just try and estimate this distance it would be rather imprecise so it's it's better if we look at this whole distance and then we can divide it down so we see in this four centimeters how many fringes we have and then we can divide the two to see how much one fringe contributes so let's see we have one two three four five six seven so we have seven fringes and four centimeters seven fringes in four centimeters so this means that uh, s is just the separation of two fringes will be um, four over seven so we will see that 0 
centimeters per fringe. And this is what we need to plug into our formula. And yeah, now we just need to rearrange for lambda, which will be s small d over big D. We now we know our fringe spacing is 0 0.5714 times 10 to the minus 2 in meters. Small d is a 0 0.18 times 10 to the minus 3. And big D is 2.2. And if we uh, solve this, we get that this is 4.7 times 10 to the minus 7 meters. And so this is the wavelength of the light. And then we are told that the two slits are replaced by many slits of the same separation. So this is going to be important. State one feature of the intensity pattern that will remain the same and one that will change. So we are told that the slits have the same separation. And the thing we need to know about these slits is that the position of the minimum and the maximum only depend on the slit separation here. And we keep it the same. We see that s is a function of this small d. It's not a function of the number of slits. So it doesn't matter how many slits we are, slits we have, the position of minimum and maximum will stay the same. Position of minimum slash maximum will remain the same as the slit separation is constant. So their position will stay the same. And uh, one thing that changes is that the maximum will become sharper. And which also means that they will become narrower. So what this means is that like if we had some, for example, this is this was our our uh, intensity distribution with only two slits. So if I copy it down here, it looks something like this. It's a normal sine sine curve. And then if we increase the number of slits, these maximums will become narrower because right now they are quite wide. This is their width approximately. They will become much narrower and they will become sharper. So what this will mean is that eventually they'll look something like this. But again, their position will remain the same. Now this uh, drawing I made isn't very uh, nice, I would say. It's not the ratio or anything. I'm just trying to show that it will become it will become something like this and then their position will align with the maximum of the initial part initial intensity distribution so uh, yeah this is also just something that we should remember if we look at experiments or something then we can observe this happening that in these this indeed increasing the number of slits will become will make these um, maximums more sharp sharper and narrower and then the next question is about uh, the Rayleigh criterion and these kinds of things and resolution well resolution is uh, removed from the syllabus so these two last questions don't affect us anymore so this was the end of question three i hope it was uh, helpful and see you in the next question